Building on the latest Levity Zone episode, which featured my heartfelt heartache on the confounding non-election of 2016, yours truly, Dr. Bruce, would like to now bring in a broader historical perspective, addressing the question of, what is the origin and evolution of the power we see expressed all around us today? This next hot tub conversation with old friend and regular conversant Alan Lundell, a.k.a. Dr. Future, is a sort of part one, tracing the emergence of power as it grew from the time of the Pauline Christians, who in the 4th century wrecked the temple at Eleusis to establish their corporation, the Roman Catholic Apostolic Church. We then go up through the Renaissance, the birth of the global trade system, and the corporation's marriage with the state, begetting empire. Through the Industrial Revolution, we take this centralization of power up to the doorstep of our own era. At the time of my fortuitous meeting with Kojak and the Serpent back in 1986, So come with us now through the machinations of the ruffians and geniuses who laid the foundations of power in our world. Tubcast, uh, the Levity Zone, Alan Lundell, Tubcast. Our exploration of uh, who is really in charge of the world right now from what we've seen so far. Now typically, Bruce, uh, talking about controlling the world is not a lot of levity usually in that topic. In that topic. I'm curious how we can introduce that into this evolution of... uh, of control. Of control. Well, the, the current system of money and power, now, where where is a good port to begin in your estimation? Uh, the Middle Ages? Medici's or yeah, before that? I think I think Medici's, Medici's because... Yeah. There's uh, a nice Netflix series on them anyway, so it's a good place. So that's a good place. Now we know it. all about it. Exactly, well, you yeah. see, the banking system in Northern Europe, with the help of coffee houses, the drug of choice brought over by... Sir Francis Drake was with the well, New World. <laughs> yeah, Sir Francis Drake with his long pipe with his tobacco, introducing <laughs> tobacco to the New World or the Old World, mm-hmm. and then coffee and the coffee houses were the two drugs that led to the visionary opening of the financial industry. Tobacco and coffee. So and coffee. So it kind of links in. Terence was into that too, where he thought alcohol was also a and component. Alcohol in was the sort Western. of a dumbing down, but alcohol fueled the baccalaurean festivals in the Mediterranean, which had yeah. a mixture of herbs. They were only one ninth or one sixth the wine, and the wine was weak. What, it like, wasn't what distilled. Other herbs, uh, mushrooms. <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Syrian rue, mushrooms, various very very stimulating herbs. So, yeah. in the festivals of of antiquity, they were getting high. Now we're talking they going back getting, to the... They weren't getting drunk as they were getting high. In Greek and Roman days. Yeah, and then there was the Eleusinian Mysteries, which was surely some kind of strong psychedelic yeah, mushroom. where they would take it before they would watch the... Uh, the oops. rising of the light from Hades as Persephone returned, yeah. you know, in the ninth day. And it was a very, very incredible thing, but roll the clock forward. Yes. So the new drugs arrived. The Catholic Church's monopoly on thought is finally cracking after they destroyed the temple at Eleusis in 396, it's finally cracking in the Renaissance and the Reformation. And so you had these people getting jacked up on coffee and tobacco in coffee houses in Amsterdam which, and London. Which harbors a different kind of consciousness, really. Yeah, and it was very much yeah. high mental, hmm. high craft, and they created all these financial instruments. Reinsurance, it was called copper bottoming because the ships that had copper on the bottom were less prone to worms. Yeah. So the copper bottoming of a ship was the reinsuring of the ship against loss. Uh, would they would survive it? Policies. Yeah, yeah, so if you lost it, you got paid. Uh, so and you need a copper bottom ship in order to get insurance. You might get a lower rate. Oh, I see. So yeah. it was yeah. considered a better investment. Yeah, better quality. And, and then yeah. stocks. So these international corporations were growing, the Dutch East India Company, the Hudson Bay Company mm-hmm. in oh, North America, exactly. and the British East India Company mm-hmm. um, had shareholders. And what that meant, you had a share note that you carried with you, and if you arrived at a trading post in Manitoba, and it was a Hudson Bay post, you could hold that up and, and they would provide you services because well, you were like, a shareholder. It was like currency in a way. It huh? was, it was. and so. Stocks were invented in that time period, and the Medici used banking all over the place. I mean, various potentates 
they were run on debt on hawk and had to be repossessed. Some principalities had to be repossessed all over time mm. because the principality would take out money, a uh, loan from the Medici or from mm. somewhere, and they couldn't pay it back, and there would be a repossession of their kingdoms. In the series on Netflix, there are people that don't like them, and they call them usurers. Usurers, yeah. Usurers. What is that? It, it, was, it was also described of Jews at the time. Yes, they mentioned that too. The money money changers and all that. Yeah, they, well they take a percentage of the exchange or something like that. Yeah, so, and a it was way like higher and higher percentages if somebody was Kind of like our credit cards <laughs> today. Yeah, and, and the, then the Swiss were holding these currencies. Yeah. And then the Swiss had a kind of Praetorian guard. They had rented out mercenaries to help guard your money and then also come and help guard your kingdom. What what really survived evolutionarily from the Medici's? What what what, worked? What happened was, so roll the clock forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Industrial Revolution? Industrial Revolution created a huge amount of wealth and it created the mill printing basically money. Now how exactly did it do that? Because it created stuff for everybody and jobs? Yeah, it removed handcraft jobs, mostly done by women, and it created factories, the satanic mills. Uh, dark satanic mills which were spinning cotton and making fabric on a massive scale. So the the, the people who owned the um, the mills got rich. Very wealthy and they were from a merchant class. They were not from the landowners. No. They weren't from, you know, the royalty connected. And the were those who worked in it, I guess, were originally farmers than the peasants. They they could have been a combination of your ruffian type, but a little smarter. Or your take, middle class. Yeah. But they didn't they hadn't had the great estates. But then they became wealthy, and before them, there were the people who ran the shipping. Yeah. If it's the 16th century, yeah. and if you can get it together to get yourself a bark or a, a nice big ship with a big hold and a crew, and you can get to the Spice Islands, which is Indonesia, mm. and fill it with spices mm. and sail back alive, you are a rich man just on one cargo. Well, one, one ship, huh? One cargo. That's how valuable. I mean, more than gold? Yes, effectively. Well, you couldn't it carry that guess. much gold. Yeah, it was worth more. It was better cargo, and so you could actually buy a little estate. And what's great about it is that people use it and need more, unlike gold, which just sits there. Yeah. So spice, yeah. spices, which were very costly coming overland from what was the Silk Road. So silks, spices, and and the fashions of the time demanded ostrich feathers and silks and dyes and cardamom and you know, turmeric and even salt was valuable. I mean, mm-hmm. the European diet didn't have much in the way of spices. It was very bland. Yeah. So, so people that got came... rich really quickly. Well, but it just was hard to get a ship from uh, the West Indies, I guess. The well, East yeah, Indies, it was, right? it was, there was a percentage chance you would never come back. Right, so you the know? high risk equals high rewards. Yeah, so these buccaneers yeah. would go out and risk the runs, and then firms formed to provide them support to build bases like in the Cape Town for rounding the Cape. Mm. And all these ports were created like Macau and where Singapore is now. So the great corporations sort of took under their wing all these shippers and took percentages, but they also had gunboats from the British Navy that would protect the merchant shipping mm. against piracy or against... So it was a whole ecosystem formed. The whole ecosystem formed and it created the global trade system and the global communication system. Wow. And that was in the 16th century, 17th, 18th centuries. Was that considered the Renaissance as well? Yeah, yeah, and that, that helped power the Renaissance. And my ancestors were admirals of the fleet, the white and blue fleet mm. for the British crown. Sir John Harmon was basically engaging European powers, competitors, in order to keep the attention away from England as it was building its empire. Mm. And the reason we're speaking English today is because of people like Sir John, you know, who I made my doublet to impress Sir John, the the portrait of Sir John. Yes, I've often seen that in your your office there. In my office, yeah. 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 That's cool. So in a sense, his DNA lives on in you. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And the memes, too. And his That's portrait hangs in the Greenwich Maritime Museum. He was an admiral in the British Navy? The Blue Fleet and the White Fleet. And There's, so he was fairly high up, and he was seeking to have a, a royal patronage. Excuse my ignorance on this, but Blue Fleet and White Fleet, those are the two types. They're, it's like, like the U.S. today has the Sixth Fleet and the Yeah, Seventh that was like that. kind of like that. Yeah, and one was higher than the other. Huh. Sir John Harmon. I've seen him in dreams 
winking at me from across the waves and he was winking at me mm -hmm. as I looked to the continent and the Europeans were fighting each other you know the kings of France were fighting the Habsburg family and yeah. And the whole idea was to keep the Europeans at each other's throats <laughs> so that Britain, which was a fairly weak place, right, yeah. could extend its power by sea. Yeah. Because Spain and Portugal had gotten there in advance and become very wealthy. Really? So they knew this? This was kind of the strategy, yeah, on the the strategy. Admir and in the Admiralty? It was a very much a strategy. So huh. France was attempting to create power in Quebec, Louisiana, Southeast Asia. France was having to get inroads in the New World, right? They had... Yeah. Yeah. And, and several colonies, but France was involved in really corrupted royalty, inbreeding royalty, and then the whole Versailles thing. And, we, and the English avoided that? The English were not under the yoke of mad kings as much. Really? Yeah, so they had a strong middle class and they had a parliament, and so they had a lot of people that could operate independent of the royalty. The royalty did not have a yoke set down across the country. And that's what made the difference, huh? That's what made the difference. That's why we speak English. That's why we speak didn't English. Have so they, in a sense, they had more freedom than France. They did, yeah. And yet, ironically, it's the French that helped finance George Washington and Benjamin Franklin for the American Revolution well, because, because the British. Because of the British. So, yeah. The British were, were the enemy. At that point. So yeah. here you have all this set up. Yeah. And where we then go is the Industrial Revolution which switched the power again to industrialists. So that was in both France and England, mostly? It was uh, initially? England initially, because England. England did all the inventions. And really? then so there was some kind of mind state in England that led to a great the Industrial oh, Revolution. Right? Colebrookdale Bridge, um, Isambard Kingdom, Brunel, and Stevenson's rail lines. Yeah. Uh, just incredible innovation and the ability to raise capital in And the markets. government supported that, huh? Well, they could raise capital in markets. Uh, a friend of mine's great-grandfather was Brunel's accountant. Hmm. And Brunel created steam Paddington Station. He created the first steamship. He built an enormous railway network. Wow, so he was a whole systems thinking guy back then. He, huh? he was like Elon Musk is wow. today. And he was a taciturn man hmm. wearing a top hat. He died in, when he was in his late 50s. I mean, this man worked nonstop. But he created magnificent things that are still standing. I mean, everywhere across southern England, you look around, it's Brunel, this and a tunnel under the Thames that oh. still works. <laughs> 1830s, been built by hand. Can you imagine keeping the water and the mud back? They invented all the technology to build this tunnel. That wow. was him and his father. Wow. wow. The Brunel Tunnel. Yeah, so that's, that's the whole thing. And, and then that came to America, but it mostly came to the Northeast. The industrial center of America yeah. was the Northeast. And yeah. the south yeah. part, Southeast was agrarian. More than and that's why the North won the Civil War, because they had cannons and they had machinery. Machine and they just, guns, they turned yeah. the South into a mincemeat. Yeah. Yeah, so America industrialized because Americans were going to England, seeing this miracles and bringing it all back. And then that's when, uh, after the Civil War, is when the, the big American family started uh, consolidating mm -hmm. the uh, Leland Stanford out here because he was a railwayman, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And then back east you had, you know, the Rockefellers and you had Carnegie yeah. and all these families. That Rockefellers, Carnegie's. Uh, Standard Oil of Indiana. These were industrialists, American industrialists. American industrials yeah. in the mold of, of the English industrialists, but even less fettered. I mean, even yeah, more. Less rules. <laughs> and more resource to draw from. More mines, more yeah, oil. Yeah. Unspoiled more continent to... to get stuff from everything so so you mm -hmm. had that powerful thing and that led up to about the 1890s 1900 when these men had formed trusts mm. and these trusts were super powerful they were as powerful as the federal government in terms of working the currency so mm. Teddy Roosevelt came in on the platform of being a trust buster that he was going to break the monopoly of these trusts mm. and one of them was Standard Oil the central bank didn't have real close control of the currency rates and things so every few years there'd be a run on the currency and there'd be major crashes this like is inflation issues and, and yeah all kinds of yeah. Uh, crashes in confidence and much more than now so and yet it was important for the industrial revolution to have a, st a stable, stable so currency. literally i think it was carnegie who uh -huh. got all of the central bankers into a room 
mm -hmm. at his estate or something or somewhere and wouldn't let them leave until they created a central bank. Did they have a precedent in Europe for that? Not the really. Sw Swiss into that uh, at all? The British, the British had a central bank. The British had a central bank. Yeah, they, that oh. created rates and standardized and measures and things and like America that. And America didn't until... And so, so literally an industrial is forced the federal government to make a central bank to stabilize oh. things. So I wonder if the American industrialists communicated with the British uh, who ran I, the central I bank think there. they studied, they they studied, studied all the than, systems. Yeah. Rather than make uh, alliances. Huh? Yeah, and so mm -hmm. this is the 19th century, and the large part of the population is illiterate, and people don't live long, and people don't have rights at work. Children die in factories and things like that. And that like was that. normal, right? That people was normal. just died in factories. They uh, died on the job. There. Around here, they died in logging camps and right. got maimed, and there was no There's social insurance. a certain insurance. percentage of people who died, and that was the way it was. That was the way it was, and so it's kind of ugly. And the 20th century changed all that. It actually made a middle class. It brought in protections, but it's so much better. Now, Donald Trump, he has not even a concept of what life was like 60, 70 years ago. They Except no, in the movies, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's no yeah. memory. There's no cultural memory. We're, we're in such good shape, and we'll be in good shape when Trump is gone. Because we've made so much progress, and no one's going to have children maimed in factories. Yeah, this kind of brings up where the power and money went from the industrialists and the American families to the middle class more, right? The middle class. Yeah, so what occurred was in the 19 teens and 20s, there was all these labor movements fighting for rights, and women fought for the right to vote. And that now, brought more money into the middle class as a part of the result of that. It did, and then the stock market crash almost killed the country, almost wiped out America as an experiment. So then Roosevelt brought in the New Deal, which created all these social safety nets. It's kind of a social uh, socialization of America. In a way. Yeah, Medicare yeah. and all these things. Social that, Security. Social Security and all this stuff and jobs programs to make sure that there wasn't a dire poverty so there was class. So there's a safety net in yeah. society. There's yeah. a safety net. and. That led into World War II, which ended up being a huge jobs program. So that kick-started the economy. And then we pick up, when I ask Kojak, the question of, is there a cabal running the world? Is there a yeah. conspiracy or a digerati well, What about the power of those old families, you know, the industrialists? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I asked Kojak, who was a professional assassin that I met, in 1986 yeah. in a hotel in Los Angeles. Like who hires you these days, dude? <laughs> yeah, and he had assassinated governments for other governments, and he was kind of on the move with his entourage. Right, the Assassin's Creed, he had a whole family going back generations. It was yeah, horrible I, trade. I asked him, how long yeah. have you been doing this? And he said, we've been doing this shit for 500 years. Oh, my God. Wow. 500 years, assassin. Yeah. And, and there's a Turkish branch and a Lebanese branch working as far back as the Medici. Wow. So that's, that's the connection. <laughs> so, you know, the, yeah. this is 1986. Today, people believe this sort of nonsensical idea that there's some kind of Illuminati running the world. But I asked Kojak in 1986, and he paused for a moment, and this is the answer that connects into our whole discussion. He said, after World War I, the families, the Rothschilds and the powerful families and the industrialists, uh, all these people, some in America, reconstituted. World War I didn't destroy the system. So we still had work, consistent work. After World uh, War II also? He said World War II mm -hmm. destroyed it. Wow. World War II destroyed those families. It destroyed Europe. It actually destroyed Europe as a power center. So, yeah. Then what happened? But America became a power center. Right. right, and he said the money started to move from that point. The money had been in Europe for a long time. That's when the mafia got big in New York. and Right, but industrial power and defense mm -hmm. money and whatever yeah. went to America. So he said the money flowed to America and with it the power, yeah. and we started working for Americans. But yeah. Americans didn't understand how to project power, yeah. so it was kind of crazy. It was kind of They chaotic. had to learn, right? They're nouveau riche. Uh, yeah, and they still yeah. don't know how to project power. So then he said in the 60s the money moved to Japan where Japan was becoming a manufacturing center. For the U.S. mostly, though, right? Yeah, for all these products. And, yeah. and then so the money started moving to Asia. And he said after 73, the oil shock, the money moved into the Middle East. A huge amount of money moved to the Middle East quickly because oil prices jumped. And this is 1986. He said, this system is like a serpent. Its back is undulating and throws anyone off. Anyone who's trying to ride it for a period of time gets thrown off. 
and it's a dynamic you described earlier. Yeah, I was looking at the fire uh, analogy where it's like a serpent, a serpent fire of some sort, yeah. right? where it breaks open somewhere else. It goes where the resources are. It goes where the resources are. Yeah. And, and so Kojak turned to me and said, not only is no one running the show, there's no way that anyone could conceivably have a picture of what's going on and do anything about it. So he said, pretty much even the most powerful individual in government or you know, a wealthy individual is going from crisis to crisis to crisis constantly. They're being hit by a crisis. As soon as they resolve something and take some action, the next crisis comes. And it's a crisis because the, also the currency shifts value too, right? Everything is constantly in, in yeah. movement. People are wondering now if um, cryptocurrencies might make a difference in this arena. I, I think just learning to live with dynamism, you know. Change, learning to live with... Yeah, uh, just, and which is, you know, what you track all the time. You know, it's a great time to be a futurist because <laughs> you just have to study the present. You know? Yeah, it's all here. <laughs> it's all here. So, in a sense, the concept of governance, the concept of a government, especially of nincompoops like, yeah. say, from the Trump world, right? It's the concept of governing anything like this, including a country like the United States, is, <laughs> is uh, nonsensical. Yeah. In a true sense, power is not the problem. The problem arises with a particular sort of people who ultimately make their way into positions within the niches of power. A corporation or government can be fair and effective, and create a lot of infrastructure and benefit a whole society. It turns into disaster when such systems are infiltrated by personality types who then turn them to other uses. Those personality types come in many shapes and sizes. Sometimes called sociopaths or psychopaths, they can also include the rigid personality, the masochist, and the narcissist. To some extent, we all have a mixture of some of these types within us, but most of us tend to manage their more pathological aspects. Each type begets something of a magical power to the person carrying it, but that power can also become distorted. Think of bullies on the school playground. This distortion has been building up globally for some time and is now uncloaking and now parading around the world stage is a dangerous new class of power players. So what can be done about it, if anything? In many past cases, the unbridled execution of such distorted power has often led to the destruction of whole societies, down to the very foundation stones of their cities. However, for the first time in human history, we have an understanding of the sources of these personality types. Each of the types are manifested through a variety of woundings or traumas, often early in the development of children. Such traumas, which might include sexual abuse, hot cold love from a parent, scare tactics by a sibling, or physical injury or illness, may cause the adult to operate primarily from the trauma. For example, a person acting on a day-to-day -day basis mainly from fear rather than trust, would be someone clearly affected by a deep-seated childhood trauma. From psychology to shamanic practices, these traumas are being recognized and, in some cases, healed. It takes a strong commitment from the person to affect their own healing, and a great deal of support and tools from a community to help them through it. But it is possible. So when you witness the abuses committed by those who distort the otherwise beneficial uses of power, try to sense their core trauma and understand that this is at the root of their actions. This trauma gives them superpowers, but also is an Achilles heel, a weak point. Inevitably, this weak point will find its time to manifest and precipitate the ultimate downfall of many actors on history's stage. However, today we may not have to helplessly wait for the ultimate messy fates of our traumatized leaders. We can avoid the cities in ruins through the active and wise intervention of an intelligence that understands this trauma and knows how to heal it, even in adults. Better still, 
We will one day learn how to prevent children from being subject to trauma or help them heal early on. Identifying and preventing bullying at school and helping the bullier and his or her family is a start on this, our most vital work to come. As we grow wise to our own natures, or in other words, when we finally learn how we boot it up psychologically, we will cultivate the best from those natures and create a sane, sustainable, and beautiful civilization. It seems, however, that this is a time of clear teaching and testing by formidable obstacles in our path. I am confident, however, that after four billion years of fortuitous evolution, this rare experiment of conscious complex life will not go up in flames, but instead we will find that way forward to a brilliant new reality. I will be on the case here in the vision hut at Ancient Oaks Farm, at least trying to work it all out and tell my own take on the story, and maybe a little guidance, too. And in a future Levity Zone, Al and I will take up part two, the almost supernaturally strange new power rising in the information age of the 21st century and its consequences for our future. See you all next time on the Levity Zone.